okay? So we have to make a choice of a lifestyle, okay? Uh, there, there are many, many things that you do not have cost. You, you know, you're not paying city taxes. You're not buying water. You're not paying sewer. You're not paying for trash pickup. And, and believe it or not, you might choose to be my, like me, and I don't even have caller ID or uh, satellite TV. So you learn to live on less, okay? Now, when you make a reasonable wage, you still got enough money to live, send your children to school, and, and have them, I've been fortunate enough to have all four of my children graduate from college. They've done a lot better than I have. But I never, ever wanted to go live in the city, so I learned to live on less, and work for less. And we've got people all over rural Missouri. These counties that I'm talking about are willing to get by like that. And that rate that I've got on there is actually an increase from what they're used to making. All right, and, and I'm understanding what you're saying, but however, you know, there was a song back from First World War, how you can keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris. The point is, with all the innovations today, all the modernization of the world, Someone making fifteen dollars an hour cannot enjoy all of that. Now the and they live in the country. Now, well, here's the other issue. I'm glad you brought that up because you said your children went through public school. I assume. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm just looking at a chart. I've, I've done a lot of research on this because I sat on the board of education for twelve years. In uh, El Dorado Springs School District, R2 School District, the state portion of their dollars are. Local is 42.24%, state 45.63%, federal 12.13%, okay? In the district that I live in, now that's out of the foundation formula, that's almost 50% of their budget comes from the state foundation formula, Yes, sir. okay? We in the city are subsidizing your schools because in the district I live in, 86%, 86.36% come from local property taxes, money that I make. 10.52% come from the state, which means you're getting an exorbitant amount in your home, one of your home school districts, that's being paid for by me, by the prevailing wage and by the t what we set in the state. And all we're saying is we want your schools to pay their fair share, be able to make the living to pay their fair share, so we don't have to pick up your cost all the time. And as it turns out, rural areas are notorious for that, out of the foundation formula, which we all know is very severely underfunded. But the point being is, you're not living there on the land free of charge, we're subsidizing you. With our prevailing wage, with our union wages, with our good jobs, Kansas City and us. The point being is, that's not a level playing field. So when I drive through on a freshman tour and I've seen some of these areas and how depressed they are economically, my heart goes out, and, and even though I'm a union person, I want them to make more money union-wise, non-union-wise, so they can enjoy the standard of living that we have in St. Louis and Kansas City and other areas. And that in lies the problem. When you say $15 per hour is plenty for anybody to live on, you told me that just you came from church and you saw those gentlemen in the, in the uh, restaurant that are working on a Sunday when it's cold, First of all, up on a roof or wherever it works, probably against OSHA standards. OSHA, okay? In my district, I was They didn't have on any hard ads either. Well, but, but again, that's against <laughs> federal law. The other issue is that's not safe. That's not a good working condition. What about their families? And going door to door, as you probably go in your district, I go in mine. When we gets dark, we stop going door to door. I'm walking through a very nice neighborhood, south right off of Union Road and, and Lee May, and I hear. And I look up, and here's a gentleman with a contractor company speaking in what appeared to be Spanish or Mexican, talking about six workers up on that roof. They're still tapping when it's dark. Now, that's, you just mentioned your children are doing better than you. My children are doing better than me. I don't want that job for my children or anybody's children in this country where they're working unsafe after dark, putting up a roof. That's what these standards are set for, for the standard of living. That's why in America, we have a standard of living. So we can agree to disagree and you can present all those figures, but I want to see the standard of living in your area and all the areas in the state rise up instead of pulling other areas down. And that's my point. Mr. Chairman, and you want to respond to five, but that's the last my question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, have we 
Let's start with Mr. Jim Fall. Thank you, Representative. <coughs> Thank you for your time again. Um, my name is Jim Paul. I'm uh, testifying in opposition to this bill on behalf of Missouri AFL-CIO as well as the building trades. Um, a little more intimidating when the sponsors sit next to me rather over there. We bought it by the <laughs> uh, The two things in this bill that I uh, wanted to point out is one, the definition change. Of, actually, three things. One, the definition change. Two, uh, the change to how counties outside of the St. Louis City and uh, St. Kansas City areas are handled, as well as then the uh, federal rate, which I understand is on uh, in front of you. As far as the federal rate is concerned, um, and the sponsor alluded to this, that, it, that in many areas it is going to raise the rate uh, for some folks here at, uh, when you take into consideration the changes that were made in 2013. Also, it's not a true reflection rate of the trades in those areas as in the rate that is uh, developed and reflected in the federal rate in the bill takes into consideration wages of everybody for a number of different disciplines, not just construction, but also uh, secretarial, administrative, and that. Uh, so if the idea is to set a reflective wage, it is likely not the best way to do it. The second uh, thing at the point I wanted to make was regarding the uh, change in the definition the definition changes uh, that are reflected here started popping up in legislation a couple of years ago as a result of a foreign company which sued the, a foreign owned company which sued the state of Missouri because they had bid a project telling the uh, local body that it was not prevailing wage. Before the start and before the bid was actually accepted, the company was told that no, this is a prevailing wage job and prevailing wage is required. And at that point, the company sued the state of Missouri, which was trying to enforce its own rate. Uh, so that language is reflected out of an effort of that after they sued the state of Missouri and lost. Um, then finally, I just want to talk briefly about the changes that were made in 2013. I went through uh, county by county over the new you know, changes. And I think as uh, the representative from the AGC alluded to, in many of these counties, you are seeing different wage rates as a result of that. Um, not in every county, but it, what it is is incumbent upon reporting, as we've said time and time again. Reporting is what sets the wages. In rural counties, uh, primarily your counties that are in your third and fourth tier, um, rather than the first and second tier uh, in the state of Missouri, they're not determined the same anymore as they are in the St. Louis area. What they do is the collective bargaining rates and the non-collective bargaining rates are separated. And before even looking at what the price is, you look, uh, in those third and fourth class counties, you look at how many hours under a collective bargaining agreement will work and how many under a non, not under a collective bargaining uh, agreement will work. And if there's more non-collective bargaining rate hours, you don't even look at the CBA hours. Those are completely cast aside. And then you look at just in those non-CBA uh, hours, what is the most frequently occurring rates? As that happened, there's a number of trades, uh, trade unions that no longer set the rate. There are 40 counties that the Asbestos Workers Union no longer sets in the state of Missouri. There are 20 counties that the Glazers no longer set in the state of Missouri. There are 48 counties that the communication technicians no longer state, uh, set in the state of Missouri. And a number of these hours, the carpenters, there's five that the carpenter counties that the carpenters no longer set the rate. And in a lot of these counties as well, the rate was set by just a few hours. Cedar County, for instance, is, and Bates County are, did not change. But no hours, they, they, did, they did not change, they did not lower. But there weren't a lot of hours submitted because of that. I know in at least a few counties, as little as two and three hours prevailed. In some counties, as many as 12 hours were all that was submitted. And just as a quick reflection, in Howell County, for instance, a cement mason rate today is $13 an hour. I can present to you, as you can probably 
imagine that is not the CDA rate, that is not a union rate. The prevailing wage for an iron worker in Howell County is $13.50. The painter rate is $9 an hour. And that's with 20 cents, I'm sorry, 21 cents in fringe benefits. The number one uh, asbestos workers, overwhelmingly their fringe benefit packages now in the halls that are in the counties that are not set by prevailing wage or by the CBA rate rather is $1.42 to $1.44 an hour, which as uh, you can imagine probably does not cover the health insurance that someone who deals with asbestos, <coughs> even if it's not their primary uh, work, even if it's incidental, $1.44 does not buy a whole lot of health insurance for an asbestos worker. Uh, so to that end, I would say we've been here for two years now. We're doing the second round now of the new law. After one year, already some things have been reflected and changed. And uh, I think you'll see that more accurate um, kind of prevailing area standard wage, rate, wages rather are going to be what's reflected here. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to entertain. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Bruce Hillis. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, my name is Bruce Hillis. I'm from Mexico, Missouri. I'm a free market advocate and an advocate for economic freedom. I testify in support of this bill, however, this bill does not go far enough. This prevailing, prevailing wage law should be repealed in their entirety. Why is prevailing wage uh, repeal necessary? Because they increase costs to the state and its taxpaying citizens, <coughs> burdensome regulations, and by limiting competition. This isn't complicated. It's that old demand and supply stuff. It's a basic axiom of economics that if you reduce the supply, you increase the cost. You won't hear uh, supporters of prevailing wage law talk much about the nasty heritage of this bill, which was mentioned earlier, or the unjust transfer of wealth. And that's what, this, that's what prevailing wage laws do. They transfer wealth. They do not create wealth. There is no moonbeam of money from which you draw on to pay a prevailing wage. When you fix the price of labor, and that price fixing by government is higher than the wage rate would otherwise be under competitive conditions, you don't create any productivity. The only way you increase wealth is you increase productivity. Increasing wages without an increase in productivity is merely transferring wealth. And that's what prevailing wage laws do. They transfer wealth. The proponents of prevailing wage will present some economic studies. I heard one mentioned a while ago, uh, and I believe that, that, uh, that study is the adverse economic effect from repeal of uh, prevailing wage law in, Virgi in West Virginia. You'll hear them claim certain things in these uh, studies, but those studies are based on models by economic planning models that completely disregard <coughs> the alternative use of that, those funds. For instance, there is, as I said, a, a moonbeam of money. Money for projects are, is not free. It has to be taken from the taxpayer citizens to fund projects. And so if through price fixing of labor, you're paying more for that project than would otherwise be produced in an open and free market, you're overpaying for that. And when you overpay for those goods, you're having to take too much money from the citizen. And the money that you have to take from the citizen to do that would otherwise be used to produce other purchases, make other purchases, make other expansions of, of uh, the size of the development or provide other services. So the, the models that they use, the REMI model, the REMS2 model, are complete fallacies because they do not take into consideration the alternative use of the funds that would otherwise be spent on prevailing wage.
proponents of preventing wage will, and as you've just briefly heard, often talk about, well, the only thing we need to do is tweak the paperwork. Paperwork, unnecessary paperwork, is no different than an, un, than an unneeded carpenter picking up an unneeded hammer. Creating this cost to produce this paperwork is government forced fed abetting and dries up the cost to Missouri and its citizens for this burdensome cost of, of calculating the prevailing wage loss, whether by the proponents that, that are in the industry doing it or whether government does it itself, you have to take money from the citizens to pay for those costs. Proponents of prevailing wage will also maintain that it produces fair and competitive bidding under prevailing wage. This is a twist on a preposterous claim often used by proponents of preventing wage, which maintains that the construction industry is uniquely subject to harmful competition that slashes wages and reduces standards, that when wages are set by law that harmful competition is avoided. That's a claim of emotional argument, not of objective analysis. Think about it. Logic alone will tell you that if the wage portion of the contract is, is set and fixed in price, contractors and others will look to other ways to reduce their cost, whether by reducing the scope of the project, as Representative Love has explained, reducing the size of the project, or rewriting the specifications to require less quality or less standards. They'll also maintain that prevailing wage laws promote unskilled workers. That in the absence of prevailing wage laws, there isn't any, there isn't any way to produce these skilled workers like through the unions. The inference put forward is that the industry depends on these unions for adequate supply of trained workers. There is no evidence to suggest that there is more of a market failure among construction workers than there is in any other occupation group. There are community colleges, private technical institutes, and other training sources. In addition, in the private market, helpers where they are learning their skills is more prevalent than it is under prevailing wage, where contractors under prevailing wage are hesitant to pay that bigger wage to an unskilled worker because, he, and so they won't bring on as many helpers into their industry. This is another claim supported by many, uh, proponents of preventing wage are a complete disguise of their real purpose. To limit competition by the force of law. This purpose applies both to the sellers of labor and the sellers of construction contracts. The sellers of labor want to limit competition from others who might underbid their price and obviously sellers of construction contracts in that preventing wage environment want to limit their competition from bidders to people that are forced to pay prevailing wage. Why is this purpose disguised? As any one of the most basic knowledge of, of economics understands that when competition is limited, prices rise. It's basic supply and demand stuff. Added cost to increased wages that result from pre prevailing wage requirements is at the expense of Missouri taxpayers and results in less government buildings and infrastructure or other goods and services. There's no other way about it. The free market should determine what the price of wet wage should be. I challenge each of you to, to send a memo out to your particular constituents and say, hey, I want to decrease your wages so that I can pay more wages to construction contractors. And that's what you do under prevailing wage. No, you don't go out and reduce their wage. You reduce their income through taxes to pay for these projects. While there's many studies by scholars with no dog in the fight to demonstrate and debunk the claims of prevailing wage proponents, you need to only look at your own knowledge base or intuition to determine this is so. Buyers love competition. Sellers hate competition. 
and that's whether they're sellers of labor with fixed contracts or fixed prices with government fixed pricing or whether they're the contractors that do it. Reduced competition is what the proponents of preventing wage are selling. Don't buy their flawed arguments. That concludes my testimony. <coughs> Stand prepared to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Representative Schmidt. Oh, oh, to a quad. Mr. Schmidt. To a quad. Okay. Oh. Uh, just a quick question. I, I heard free market a, f a few times. Like, what's what's your definition of free market? Is it just here in Missouri? Is it nationwide? Is it international? Free market is free market wherever you find it. It's unrestricted by government intervention and price fixing, price setting, manipulating the labor supply, manipulating the incentives for labor to work. That's uh, that's what free market is. So if you and I are both carpenters, same skill level, representative love has a job, if you want to charge, if I want to charge $30 an hour and you want to charge 10, you should get it. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, okay. um, what if you currently are on food stamps and living in subsidized housing? Should you still get that, that job over me? No. Okay. Why is that? Because you're being sensitive. No, because I don't think there's any favoritism applied in the free market. The free market oh, well, no, determines no, no, based on, on com com competitive uh, events. I know, but if, if you're being subsidized indirectly by the government with your housing, maybe school for your children, health care from the, 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 the darn Obamacare, you, you're getting all of this. And I'm not. I'm paying for it from the wages I make. Should you still... The wage independent of any kind of environment should be a free market. Okay, so but that's that's hard to determine though. Because you can't Oh there's lots of collective corruption in our in our system. And when I talk about collective corruption, I'm not talking about illegal corruption. I'm talking about legal corruption. And prevailing wage is a legal corruption. But how by law it's allowed, but it is still corrupting the free market system. How do you stop the, the illegal portion in the free market? So if I come out of some state and I may have undocumented workers who fled to this country because they were being terrorized. <coughs> and if I give them a bowl of rice and a cup of water, they'll say, hey, I'll do anything for you. I'm bringing that to the table. And you're paying taxes and, 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 and doing it the right way. How, how can you stop that corruption? I, I don't really understand your question, but I will say this, that the free market should determine wage rate. Okay. And I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's in my opinion, not that pure because the free market has been corrupted in a sense. It has all been corrupted. Ends. So and I'll agree with you that in many respects, mostly by government intervention in the marketplace, such as preventing wage loss. Okay. And I think through contractors doing slick stuff to get like free labor. But okay. We, we can agree on that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Let me pray. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Mr. Ellis, you remember the show Green Acres? I do. What was your opinion of that? I mean, what was the basic premise of that show? <laughs> You're asking me to reach back in the long place. I'll, I'll tell you what, what I had for breakfast. Mr. Please. Douglas, the attorney that wore suits, that had lived in New York with his wife, who was from New York, decided that he wanted to move to the farm and live with the rural people. Downsize, so to speak. <coughs> live a simpler life. He chose to do that. He, he wanted to do that. Now, do you think he made as much money in Hooterville as he did in New York City? Well, I doubt in Hooterville they set the price of wage. <laughs> right, but he chose to do that because he, yes. that's what he wanted to do. When you look in this room today, I see a lot of people here from St. Louis and maybe Kansas City. I'm not sure where they're from. But I don't see, other than maybe myself, anyone here for, from Hooterville. But let me, why is that? Why would that be? Why is that in this conversation? Why is this conversation went from 
a labor issue to a urban rural issue and that's really what we're doing here that's really what we're dealing with well i really think that uh, you'll see a lot of proponents of uh, prevailing wage in the room and probably not many people that are opposed to prevailing wage in the room why is that why does that happen economists call that concentrated benefits versus dispersed cost concentrated benefits when you have a concentrated benefits like government is going to spend a million dollars here on this little project you'll have a lot of people that can are seeking to get that million dollars come in and advocate for it but the dispersed dispersed costs are that you have a million taxpayers going to pay a buck they ain't going to take the time to come argue for against this kind of the intervention in the free marketplace so it's that old concentration of benefits versus dispersed costs that gets all of the proponents of preventing wage in an uproar because they have much to gain from prevailing wage. <coughs> But you don't see the people that you're going to go send a dollar bill to say I'm reducing your wages by a dollar so I can fund this prevailing wage for these people. You don't see that because they can't afford to come up here and argue that point for that little of, the, of a reduction in their income. We also heard the, the discrepancy or the difference in the schools and the property tax. We've heard that here today. And quite frankly, I get just a little bit offended when I hear that because we know that, he, that St. Louis and Kansas City are the economic drivers of the state. We know that. But we also know that rural Missouri feeds the state. And if, if people wanted to pay $8 a gallon for a gallon of milk, that's probably where it should be compared to, fair, to, the, to the actual market if you look at inflation. But I don't think anybody in St. Louis wants to do that. So there's a lot of reasons that the wages are, aren't as much in rural Missouri. And there's a lot of reasons that we don't pay the property tax. But still, I think if we, if we continue down that road of having the mentality that our state, uh, that, that rural Missouri isn't that important or doesn't produce as much revenue or whatever, I don't think that's the road we need to be going down. We know that it takes the whole state to make this state work. Would you agree with that? I will say there's lots of intervention in the, in the marketplace from the, in the cities in the cities where tax credits go to build a stadium or help build a stadium the rest of the state pays for it there are, i couldn't calculate all of the impact of interventions i can have a grasp of the understanding that if you free up the market what can happen thank you mr Trellis. thank you mr chairman thank you sir uh, i'd like to hear from denise hasty please again, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, the AGC of Missouri is um, opposed to this bill for many reasons. It's already been outlined in previous statement, although we do take exception with the uh, changes to proposed changes to definitions of construction and maintenance. As all of you are aware, uh, MoDOT's budget is in, in dire straits, and the way we read the definition of construction and maintenance, uh, most if not all of the existing MoDOT budget could fall outside of the definition of prevailing wage. So uh, with all um, with that, I'll, I'll be brief. Thank you very much. Representative Burns. Uh, permission to inquire. Um, so you're here reporting prevailing wage. A gentleman before was reporting the free market society. A couple of terms were said in there. Number one, he was talking about any kind of government subsidy. I believe that our dairy producers, a lot of our cattle producers are subsidized. So some of the reasons those things are held down, just like prevailing wage sets a tone, it sets a tone in those two. In fact, we just passed a bill, a dairy bill on the floor, that's going to help subsidize dairy farmers in the state. I supported that bill, and I support it wholeheartedly. And that's not the point. The point is the standard of living, which you're purporting prevailing wage. The other term I heard was feather gutters. You said feather bedding. I heard that term when I was four years old, and I'll never forget how I heard it. My father worked on a railroad, and they sold a bill of goods to the American people that railroad workers were feather bedders because the union with the railroads were fighting to keep the firemen on the engines. They didn't stoke engines anymore, they went to diesel engines. But they wanted them there because that side of the train was watched by the firemen. 
The government got their way under the Eisenhower administration. Doesn't matter who the president was, but that's whose administration was. They forced the firemen out of the trains. Railroad workers were feather bedders. My father was livid. The number of accidents on trains, switchmen getting cut in half, switching cars because that safety feature was not there. But for the sake of profit, they cut those people off. That's still a bad standard of living. And that's what this is all about. We're talking about standard of living. Also, that free market society is what sent our jobs, which you go through rural Missouri. One of the reasons our schools are down in their taxes, because those jobs, those shoe, those shoe factory jobs, a lot of those manufacturing jobs are in China now. That's the free market. Is that what we're trying to do to this country, make us China? Because it sure looks like it to me. And I've lived a long time, and I've lived through a lot of these things. Keep those wages down. If that were true, it wouldn't be down predominantly, and our CEOs wouldn't be making five and six hundred times the amount that their factory workers are, ma are making if they're blessed enough to still have a job in this country. So I think it's time we start looking at America as a job provider and jobs kept in America. And you don't do that by continually cutting wages. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Terry Briggs, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Terry Briggs, I'm a registered lobbyist for the Site Improvement Association. We're an association of contractors, mostly in the subcontracting business. We're opposed to this particular piece of legislation that the representative sponsored. I'm not going to bore you with all the details from the previous opposition, so I'll just leave my written testimony here. I will say that we do think that if you give enough time, you will see the wages, as Mr. Fall alluded to, start to go down or to adjust themselves, not necessarily go down, but to adjust themselves to more accurately reflect what is in the local areas. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Senator Green, are you still here? Didn't see you back there. Thank you once again. I'm here representing over 220 electrical contractors from the eastern side of the state in opposition to this bill. Uh, I will be brief, but just to add to a few things for the history. In the mid-1930s, uh, there were several United States elected officials, Davis and Bacon, that came up with the idea, and they were actually Republicans, and the people pushing the issue was the construction industry. It was not the labor movement or labor unions. A lot of the contractors, as was stated before, from the South were underbidding on federal projects, contractors from the northern, northeastern side of the United States. So they said, we need to set some type of wage rate so that we can compete in our own backyard. And then in 1958, the state of Missouri followed suit. The one thing that is different in the public sector, as opposed to the private sector we have to keep uh, in light of, is it is required under state law and federal law that when it comes to construction, you go with the lowest responsive responsible. There is no definition in our Missouri statutes of responsive and responsible, and everyone knows what the definition of the lowest is. So the reason the prevailing wage law is there is so the contractors in that region can compete. Now another area you do not see too much of in the political subdivision area is there is no requirement to go with the lowest responsive responsible when a school district or a municipality is hiring legal counsel. There is no requirement in state statute to go with the lowest responsive responsible when a school district or a municipality is going for an architect or engineering firm. But when it comes to construction and the contractors, they are, the political subdivision has that requirement. So one of the reasons the construction industry and the contractors have always been supportive of prevailing wage is it sets a local wage rate, whether it's union or non-union. But it was not the labor unions that created these state statutes. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hefner? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you. My name is Raymond Hefner. I'm a registered lobbyist representing the Plumbing Industry Council and the Missouri Association of Plumbing and Equipment Contractors and the Sheet Metal Contractors Association of St. Louis. 
would like to go on record in opposition to this bill. I would urge you to take a look at the uh, report that I left previously. Um, it does not only focus on West Virginia. It hits a number of the contiguous states in the state of Missouri about the economic benefits of prevailing wage for the state. With that, I will leave my testimony and answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. McBride. Uh, again, Adam McBride, registered lobbyist, uh, representing roughly 14,000 construction craft laborers throughout the state of Missouri. Um, as the chairman knows, I don't like to repeat things that have been said before. I don't think anybody cares for that. There are two things that I think that we haven't really addressed. Um, one is, in fact, the wage survey system that the federal government, that this bill prescribes that we look at. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics randomly, and it's not even annually, uh, on a random basis, they'll send out a voluntary wage survey by industry. We're talking secretaries, construction workers, um, housekeepers, you know, janitors. Uh, it's across all sectors and all industries. Uh, it is voluntary. The other main thing to keep in mind about the wage survey system, this metro and non-metro from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, it does not ask nor does it want any information on benefits. So the wage rate from however few do get filled out um, and, and submitted back to the federal, <coughs> excuse me, the federal government has absolutely zero uh, benefit data at all. Even if it were an open shop contract, it would say as a for matching 401k plan. Um, there is no space for that to be submitted uh, versus our state system, which doesn't take into account uh, any fringe benefits that may or may not be paid. Uh, I ran through a couple, and the only other thing that I really wanted to note is, uh, based on actuarials for our fringe benefit program outside of St. Louis, so this is our outstate health and welfare program, uh, they base their uh, long-term projections on the average construction worker works roughly 1,600 hours in a year. Your average full-time, five-day a week, 40-hour week employee, 52 weeks a year, 2008. Well, roughly 400 fewer hours due to weather or due to demand or you know, due to any number of things, they come with working in an industry like the construction industry. So if you take some of these, and I, he's done his own work, he's got them. I only have uh, for myself, which is the laborers. Um, so based on 1,600 hours, uh, if, you, if you buy that, and I do, these people are pay a lot of money and a lot smarter than me to come up with that figure. Uh, in Barry County, for example, I just I pulled four different counties that this bill would impact. In Barry County, the BLS wage would be $12.36 an hour for a laborer. That's $19,776 a year. So under this act, that would be the current wage rate for a general laborer in Barry County. St. Clair County, which I believe is your home county, $15.42 an hour. It's actually a little higher than most of them are. That would be $24,672 annually. 24600 annually would be what that construction worker on average would make. I shall disagree with you on that.